Hello and welcome to the first episode of The Mining Experience, a live podcast that invites professionals from the mining industry to discuss new technologies, address challenges, and share work experiences. My name is Mohamed Zaki. I'm, I'm your host for today, and I'm a marketing specialist here at ProMine. I graduated from the mining engineering program from McGill University, and I've been working with ProMine for more than two years now. And I'm here today with Martin. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Gradillas. I'm an account executive for the U.S. here at ProMine. I'm a mining engineer from the University of Sonora, and I'm very happy to be your co-host for today. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. And we have the honor to host uh, three special guests today. Dr. Hani Mitri, welcome. So Dr. Hani Mitri is a professor of mining engineering at McGill University. He has more than 30 years of experience in research and teaching in underground mining, rock mechanics, ground control, mine design, and feasibility studies. He has supervised to completion more than 60 masters and PhD students and published more than 200 papers. He's a licensed engineer in the province of Quebec since 1987. Dr. Hani Mitri, welcome. Hello, everyone. Next, we have Mr. Carl Fecto, a father of two boys and an electrical engineering graduate. Mr. Carl has always been working for startups in high tech slash research and development. Currently the CEO at Nemesis Intelligence, and his team's mission is to bring the underground mining industry into the high tech world. Mr. Carl's philosophy consists of knowledge is power and time is money. We give you the knowledge to save time. With a passion in aviation and an airline pilot license, he has the personality of an entrepreneur with a goal to improve humanity. Mr. Carl, welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. And next, we have Mr. Nick Vukovic, an engineer and director with mining, geological, and geotechnical educational background. He has hands-on experience in finding and evaluating mining projects and taking them from exploration into production. He has a proven track record with mergers and acquisitions in the precious and base metal sector. In addition, he has a lot of experience in large-scale open pit and underground hard rock mining, which includes development, shaft sinking, tunneling, operations, and heavy construction projects in North America and on an international level. Mr. Nick, welcome. Thank you, guys. Excellent. So uh, welcome, everyone. How are you all doing today? I all hope good. you're uh, in for a treat. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I guess we can start by talking a little bit uh, to the od audience and explaining them the concept of feasibility study. So Mr. Carl, for some people in the audience who might be unfamiliar with the concept of feasibility studies, can you tell us a little bit about it and why is it important? It's really important to, uh, to know if you can answer the question of your customers or how you can do. Example, in the mining industries, you have normally four, you know, four stage of uh, feasibility studies. You have the, what we call the concept, conceptual study. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's more high level just to see if on the economic point of view, it it's will work. After that, you can go on the, I will say, uh, preliminary economic assessment. Uh, where you know you have like you still have a large gap in term of uh, approximation plus or minus 40 40 percent around and after that you go deeper and deeper uh, at this yeah. stage of the uh, pre-economic assessment now you, you should be uh, compliant with the 40 uh, 43 101 and you go deeper after that you have the pre-fallacy studies where uh, you have multiple different options that you will look into it and finally you have the feasible studies Absolutely, yeah. And uh, and that's for the mining industries. And you have also the same thing in different industries. My background is more in electronics. We still have something. We have some customer that will uh, around say, hey, can I produce this for that price or something? Like that? And you need to do physical studies to assume if if it's a, a go no go for the project or not. I see. Okay. Very in interesting. Dr. Mitri, can you elaborate on this? What is feasibility studies and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, well, feasibility study in general in engineering is a, a decision-making tool. 
So it, it helps the project uh, owner or the, or the client to proceed or uh, reject a, a proposal. So, but uh, usually they are classified uh, based on the level and quality of information. So like Carl said, uh, in mining, we have, we have four levels. We have the, the conceptual uh, preliminary economic assessment or PEA. Sometimes we call it the scoping study. And then there is a pre-feasibility study. And finally, we have the feasibility. The, the input parameters uh, for, for a feasibility study is essentially uh, the results of exploration, drilling, and sampling, uh, results that leads to uh, mineral results. Uh, then along with that, we get uh, geotechnical data about the rock mass quality or uh, geological structures and uh, if any hydrogeology uh, information. Mm -hmm. So the difference between um, these levels is essentially uh, lies with the mineral resource. So it starts as, a, as an assumed resource uh, with an assumed cutoff grade. Uh, mm -hmm. Then as the as exploration efforts uh, bring in more information, it eventually becomes an ore reserve um, based on a proven and probable reserves with a well-defined or optimized cutoff grade. So you start from um, a very crude estimate based on assumptions uh, to measure an indicated resource uh, all the way to proven and probable reserves. And of course, come along with that along the line, we gain more knowledge about geotechnical and hydrogeology. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Very in interesting. Um, so, it sounds like there are a lot of factors to be taken into consideration here. Cause I know, you know, like you need to evaluate your resources, you need to evaluate how much it's going to cost. And it looks like it's super overwhelming. So within that range, um, Mr. Nick, can you tell us um, how much engineering time or effort uh, that would be involved in this? Like besides all the cost estimation and all of those, what, what kind of engineering would come into place here? Right. Well, a feasibility study requires a lot of engineering. As you can imagine, the precision on feasibility studies are roughly between plus and minus 10, uh, plus and minus 10 to 15%. So this is the gate to the detailed engineering. And after that, we're putting the final orders on the major items. And uh, this is where we're going into the EPCM phase. So it's really fundamental uh, crossroad where all the uh, trade studies and, and uh, uh, alternatives for equipment or PFE or anything else stops and then freeze and then accept the A version going forward. And then the detail, like more detailed engineering comes in to bring like what we said for preliminary economics of 50% plus and minus accuracy down to 15% or 10% on feasibility level. It's, it's a big step. And basically that tells that on billion dollar project, you will be within a hundred million dollars on your estimates and the cost and uh, you know, pretty much 10% on your rates of uh, uh, grade recovery or, or, or you know, on a tonnage you're gonna produce and everything else. So that usually, depending on what the work has been done and if the people didn't, what we like to call change the horses midway through the races, if you have a good solid team that takes this all the way from preliminary economics to pre-fees and feasibility and, and all of this, then that phase could be between 12 I would say to 18 months executed successfully. And uh, usually it's, it's entailed between 50 to $150 million in engineering costs, depending on structure that you put in. And what it is, is as I said, it's a long work, but if you changing a lot of uh, players uh, and, and, and you changing the story on the projects or you're not sticking to original thoughts and, and, or new data comes in and you have to revise the project accordingly. And this could be a very expensive phase and it could go even to uh, two two years you know, or, or, or even more, you know, to be successful in the end in application. So that's my experience with the six projects that I developed in uh, worldwide, you know, in the different environments for the major mining companies. I see. Very interesting. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mitri, can you elaborate on this? How much engineering time or effort would, would be involved in this type of project? Okay. Um, Starting with the preliminary economic, uh, starting with the conceptual, um, very little information is available. Assumptions are made about the mineral resource, the cut of grade, 
Mining method is not selected, so it's not identified. Mining equipment is not mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a it's a study that takes maybe plus or minus eighty hours, and you could be off by one hundred percent in terms of cost estimate. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it takes us all the way to the scale of a, the final feasibility study, uh, where the cutoff grade. Well, for, first of all, the ore body is well defined. Uh, the cutoff grade is optimized already. The block model has been finalized and optimized. The mining method is identified and selected. Okay. It could be one or two, but it's it's identified and selected. Equipments are listed, sized, quantified. Uh, so that leads to a detailed estimation um, uh, of the cost. And the cost is plus or minus 20% in a final feasibility study. Uh, the hours um, from 80 hours for conceptual to maybe 1500 and above. So it could oh. easily be 2000 hours. Um, and we're not talking engineering. Detail. That's not even engineering. No, that's, there's no, there's no yeah. mention. It, it could be like five to ten percent engineering, but the, the the main mining it could be significant. It could be. I see. Yeah, more like 75, 80 percent mining engineering details. Oh, okay, so that so that I assume it takes a huge uh, part of uh, all the it, all the planning and yeah, it's a. It's a huge effort. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Martin, did you have a question? I know you had some interesting questions to ask there. Maybe the audience would uh, be interested in that. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask um, uh, Mr. Carl, uh, regarding the NI43101 and what stage should it be incorporated in a feasibility study? Uh, it's not in, uh, it's not mandatory to have it on the conceptual study because at that point it's more uh, I was I don't want to be but I don't want to be rude but it's more kind of a guessing you know a guessing game you know yeah. you, you take for okay. a right assessment based on your experience based on the field or something like that so and the 43101 must be incorporated at at the start of the preliminary uh, preliminary PEA preliminary economic assessment down to the all the all down to the final one that is the feasibility studies i see okay because yeah no no you, you can continue oh yeah okay uh because normally the conceptual study that's something that you will keep internally it's not something that you will publicize it's 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 for it's a high level study that uh it just for management can say okay does I will invest that much money as Nick says, you know, on, if you want to go on, you know, only 10% on a billion dollar project. Uh, so it's take a lot of effort. So does the assumption that we have is good enough so we can invest money. So you go step by step and at each step you have a go, no go. And, and, and that's how you proceed. But at one point when you go for capital raising, uh, the law obligated to have the, uh, 43, one one that's correct. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, would you, would you want to add on this question? I just don't like when we're calling the feasibility study. Oh, I think we have to, uh, having a little bit of a, reserved for a PA, not yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think we're having a little bit of a delay here. Uh, yeah. Mr. Nick, I think, um, it's, I, I, your, your, your voice is a bit low. Is it, uh, yeah. maybe your mic is just a bit far away, but yeah, it's, uh, Okay, I, I can make that better. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Excellent. What yeah. I was just saying is I would like us to, when we're talking about feasibility, yeah, when we talk about feasibility study that we do not talk about conceptual. Conceptual is done at the preliminary economic. Right. Not at yeah. the That's preliminary. correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Like we uh, we have the conceptual pre-feasibility and then feasibility comes, but, but, but I guess, um, you know, like the, uh, Dr. Mitri can probably elaborate on this, but you have... Yeah. the conceptual and pre-feasibility that affects a lot the feasibility stage, right? Yeah, but like I said, there are four levels. The, the first level conceptual, it is not mentioned in the NI43101. Mm -hmm. So the NI43101 begins with a preliminary economic analysis, followed by pre-feasibility study, followed by feasibility study. Those three, it's an obligation. 
it's, an, it's mandatory to declare uh, the, the ore based on NI4311, okay? You see. Uh, scoping, it is optional. Like, like Carl said, it could be an internal study, but if, if, you're, um, if you want to include NI4311, sure, why not? The, uh, the, the more, the better in terms of disclosure, because we, the purpose of, of this standards is to, is to re remove any possibility of fraud, cheating, misleading information, corruption, that's the whole purpose of NI43101. So mm -hmm. no one is allowed to go and um, and make a public release on a mineral resource uh, to enhance the possibility of selling more shares uh, unless his, his release is supported by uh, an NI43101 report. I see. And Dr. Mitri, what would you say the main elements of a feasibility study are? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we look at the feasibility study, the main elements, okay, so you, you have you have a well-defined ore body with a well-defined cutoff grade, and uh, along with that, you've collected uh, sufficient information on the on the rock mass and hydrogeology. So this uh, this information enables you now to uh, go at the first the first goal. First goal is to uh, select the mining method. So this is a, a major item in, in one of the the, the first items of a feasibility study. Once you have the mining method, so you can proceed with uh, estimation of production, life of mine, scheduling, right. selection of material, okay, equipment selection, measure, and as well as uh, uh, secondary equipment, stationary equipment. Um, once you do that, you can go into mine services, such as ventilation. Uh, then you uh, uh, and then you start doing the mine design infrastructure and, and um, surface and underground. With this information, you can estimate the work the workforce, so you can have a handle on your your annual uh, salary for both uh, uh, hourly and um, and salary. I see. So that's pretty much the end of the design. Then you start the economic analysis to do the net present value and then environmental impact study, and then you finish off with um, the uh, social impact study. Right, okay. So a lot of a lot of steps there, huh? Yeah, it looks it, like it a- It's a lot of steps. Yeah. It's a lot of steps. It's a long yeah, process. I see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Nick, in your in your experience, um, what, what other factors might come in handy here when uh, determining the main elements of a feasibility study? I'll put the three more, at least. Uh, <clears throat> the environmental impact assessment must be well underway with the project for that part. A lot of monitoring analysis, uh, especially in regards to acid leaching and uh, potential uh, tow berm constructions and uh, the way it's going to be that's going to make the huge impact on uh, overall material handling and rock, rock waste management and uh, all these nine yards with the tailings. So that's, that's the one thing. Another thing is the PFD, it must be defined and it's all right. Uh, with a final list of uh, major lead equipments and uh, consumables and rates and everything else is defined at this stage. And uh, that's basically what, what I will add to it. So these are the elements that what Mr. Uh, what Professor Mitri said is just adding to it. So they must be all defined, uh, sealed. And at this stage is just no return. Basically, we're going to detail engineering and EPCM phase. So that has to be well documented and uh, well supported with a pilot test and uh, for metallurgy and process flow diagram that's based on these pilot tests uh, and uh, and stuff like that. So it's, it's all lined up, frozen, confirmed, and analyzed at this stage and expressed in the cost and estimates that should be within a plus and minus 10 or 15%. Great. Yeah, great. Um, Okay, excellent. So I, I think, uh, yeah, those those items, everything you said are very interesting points um, that uh, that I, I think, in my opinion, you know, like are very important to be successful. You know, in terms of the planning, the all the all the process that goes into that, it's 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 very important. You know, so those are those are very in, in interesting points that you mentioned there. And um, Mr. Carl, I know that you have a lot of work experience on field and you can you can you share with us a little bit on the um, one of the 
I would say, what are the most important things that need to be successful when um, you're doing planning or not necessarily, you know, like in, in the decision making process, how, how important is that and what factors are the most important? Uh, I just want a smaller correction. I don't have the experience, uh, a lot of experience on the mining field. I have a lot of experience in electrical engineering, something else project. I'm oh, okay. Really, yeah, yeah, that I'm, would that would be I'm, great. I'm just, I'm share just, with us, I'm, too. Just, yes. uh, I'm just really, uh, I would yeah. say, a baby in the mining industry as compared to me. <laughs> and, uh, Not to a Dr. problem. Ernie. But um, yeah. what I see from my uh, my small experience on that field, on the mining industry, is the social acceptance. Uh, I've yeah. been uh, visiting a few other projects, I will say in South America or something like that. And that's one of the great thing. I uh, saw so the mining industry like shift over time on the social acceptance where they uh, restore a lot of the environment around. They even bury underground the, the crusher, so they eliminate the dust, the noise, and uh, the seeing of the equipment. Uh, so when the, the mining industry does all that, is to be sure that the social acceptance, and even the sometimes the, uh, the I saw in one project, they share the profit with the population around, just to be sure that, you know, they will go dig at the point. And that's a huge shift in the mentality I saw in the last 30 years. I see. I see. I don't know if Nick can uh, continue because uh, he has way more experience. Than yeah. <laughs> no, no, on the contrary, it's we're we're happy to have you. And, uh, you know, I, I know that you have a lot of work experience. So you, that's why I was asking you that question, you know, so uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear that actually. But um, uh, maybe... Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Nick can actually el elaborate on this a little bit more. Which of which of those items that you mentioned are the most important for success in in a feasibility project, re regarding the main elements of a feasibility study? Well, we talk about planning here. We're talking about decision making process. Uh, they both very substantial and fundamental. Uh, I proud I proud myself for calling uh, Freeport McMoran and Rio Tinto and BHP when I led the teams that developed 94% average plan execution on a monthly basis, and that's not just by quantity but by quality as well. So as you can imagine, a lot of elements comes into the play. Many people think they know how to do planning theoretically, yes, but practically it's very hard. It's a big, big kind of a gap between how to execute theoretical into the practice. Oh, I think we're uh, yield the right results. What I found out, and I'm teaching, if I can say, I'm teaching this and preaching to everybody is is uh, communication is number one. Uh, that that's a really fundamental factor in execution, of planning, and and decision <laughs> process. Understanding the key inputs and parameters that drives each discipline or each group, and uh, key performance indicators that 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 outlines the performance of it, and what is the feeding into them. So what they require is a feedback from other parties and what is the output they're providing. So understanding what I call the roadmap of information on how to collect all of this is very important. So what that usually entails is maintenance downtimes, uh, entails any projects that needs to be done, uh, any planet and planet, let's put it this way, uh, outlines of all of this communication that needs to take place and delays that you can quantify. I usually use three to five days of delays that could or might have impact on a monthly plan executions as, as a guideline. So you like to recognize, put them in a right perspective, communicate it, and then implement it inside the plan and reflect it in the plan. So that way, the key is basically this communication and teamwork is to work with the people, receive the feedback, understand the pain, and incorporate that pain into the plan. So that then plan reflect on the individual units or disciplines, reality and goals they're trying to achieve. So you don't have to police you rather have uh, everybody executing the plan that they see the partition partition that. So, so that's what my success with this. And the same similar story is the decision making process. I love to have a control factors in place where transparency plays a key role. Uh, I have a simple methods that I use. Alexander Proudfoot, as you know, is the is the best management consulting company in the world, and I'm really proud to work with these guys for the last three years. And uh, as you can imagine, we 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 leading for we leading for good reason. So control mm -hmm. factors are the one that integrates, presents, and uh, and uh, provide, as I said, transparency. I like to call it the war room. When you come into my office or where my team is working is I want you to walk inside of that room 
at the very beginning, uh, see the scope and what we're trying to do. And then as you walk all the way around, I want you to tell me, do you understand the story, where we are, what is our upsides and downsides, what is our goals, targets, and what we see in our KPIs. So that's basically what, what, what I like to contribute to this, and I like to other people I see. To talk as well. I see. And interesting, interesting, yeah. Uh, Dr. Mitri, how is the decision to move uh, made to move from one study to another made? The main the main decision tool in the feasibility study is called SWOT, uh, SWOT, which stands for uh, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. So it, it's very important that uh, that the the study team highlights. Uh, this at the end of, of each study phase. So the, the study must highlight the, the strong features of the project. For example, if you have uh, a high grade deposit or the mine is in a good uh, political uh, climate, then these count for strength. So strength is, is more about uh, what is known a priori that is good about the project versus uh, the weakness. A weakness is is more the deficiencies that are also known in advance. For example, uh, you're looking at a mine in a, in a super dry environment, a uh, desert environment, and it's hot and dry, and uh, there is a, a known fact of shortage of water. Uh, so that becomes a weakness of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, or you discovered a, a new uh, deposit in a region uh, where you know in advance that this in this region, uh, there is uh, a lack of uh, skilled uh, labor. Now, the 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 O for the for the opportunity is about now. Why is this project now good for the community? Uh, now good for the shareholders. So there is a, a lot of thinking into into this as well, uh, and you you uh, you compare the opportunity versus the threat. Threat represents uh, the unknown, okay, for example, a volatile commodity market that is difficult to track in the market with a steady uh, price increase or price decrease, uh, this is called volatile market. So that presents a, a threat. A, a mine that is um, deep and there is, um, there is potential for mine disasters due to seismic activities and, mm -hmm. uh, and strong yeah. runners. That becomes a threat. So SWOT is is the tool that moves you from uh, from one phase to the other. Right. Yeah. And I guess right now, we're, would you say that this COVID nineteen situation is more of an opportunity or a threat? Uh, <laughs> in, initially, um, initially, COVID nineteen was was caused a almost a paralysis. A, it paralyzed the mining. Uh, industry then before yeah. you know we got around it so uh, there is um, i don't know of any mine that is closed right, right. now all mines that i'm in communication with are up and running so if you are in, in a remote site uh, they will use you for 14 days but they will isolate you uh, for 14 days, you're doing work every day. Then you go to the site and you do your yeah. <laughs> rotation. Pretty much, yeah. Take you home. <laughs> so the client fly out. The business is working fine, and um, uh, mining is, is doing well in COVID. Surprisingly, unlike other industry, but it's not like the, for example, like the uh, the airline industry that's uh, heavily impacted. Yeah, very, very imp yeah, yeah, heavily impacted. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So, yeah. Martin, did you have anything uh, to add there? Uh, I think you had some really good ideas there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I had a question um, for Mr. Carl. When going back to when when Mr. Vukovic was talking about the the key parts to a well to a feasibility study, um, as the CEO as of Nemesis, I I think. Well, I think that it needs a lot of leadership to have this communication throughout throughout the company and throughout projects. How how do you see like the importance of leadership and able to have good communication to have success in all your projects? 
I think you're oh, I think unmute. you're I think you're muted, but yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, as Nick said previously, uh, communication is mm -hmm. keys. Uh, that's one something that will say um, I'm from the electronics, microelectronics industries, where we have a tons of tools of communication. And it's it's really mm -hmm. easy. And arriving in the mining industries, where I, will, I saw a lot of people working more in silos, uh, little shocked me because you know, uh, if if you want to achieve a, a good goal as a team. You need a, a communication that is uh, that everybody understand the objective, and to be sure that you empower everyone in your team, and that is the key. And for that is communications. And if you have a lot of feedback, because something people can see that you don't see, and and it's dynamize uh, all the teamwork. And that is really important. Everybody has a voice, uh, and all those voices are really important because example for me i'm not as on the field as somebody else and i need to have those, those eyes those suggestions and sometimes I, I may have ideas but they may not be practicals mm -hmm. on the field for this region and this reason so that's why it's really really important to have an open mind discussion with everyone and to be sure that uh if somebody has a great idea then you emphasize and and, and you move forward with it uh it's uh we're we're all on the same boats. We want everything. Right. So it's really, really important. And that's one of the things that our tools brought is, you know, it's the backbone of communication we want to put in the mind. So every, with the digital clones, what is provide in terms of mining operation is everybody has the same, uh, are on the same page. Because right now, Absolutely. Absolutely. right now what you have is you have a few engineers that have the mining plans, but they, they don't, it's not shared. Everybody shared a paper plans or something like that. So now that everybody with, I will say, iPad or iPhone can have the full treaties, uh, models of the mines and understand the goals and everything. And maybe sometime if you understand the, between the engineering that is doing the planning and we will say the production that is right, right down the galleries and they, they don't, sometimes when they don't talk that much, they, it creates frustration between the two groups because they don't understand how what the engineering ask is impossible down the down the ground because you have like you know it, somebody work with the theoretical plan and somebody work with the real life but mm -hmm. both has different yeah. image of the mind mm -hmm. so it's really important that we, when you have a digital clone everybody has the exact same view of the goals and that is really important absolutely yeah i mean being on the same page especially when you're doing feasibility studies because you're essentially planning on you know, like a mine includes civil department and electrical department, not necessarily just a mining department, right? So yep. if if in your initial plan, you don't put anything that allows you to be on the same page later, like you said, that would be a huge, 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 huge problem. So those and, are those are very interesting points, yeah. Yeah, and, and just not that because you have, you know, you, you have, you pass, you, you need to pass your electrical, you need to pass your air, you need, you know, you you, you have a lot of different things that you, it's, it's all in the same small uh, galleries and you need to have a sequence in that. And the thing is, if you do a right planning and you're not just theoretical in your right shape box and you say, okay, that I cannot pass my tubing there because I have like this kind of, you have an overbreak or underbreak there. Mm -hmm. I need to move around. But if you move around, then your, your truck need to, you know, you, you, if you have, you, you move around your big air vent, then at, at one place, I saw it in the mine, it, it was crossing the galleries. And at one point, you know, the truck w didn't respect the uh, 1.5 meter each sides uh, mm -hmm. for pedestrians. So that now you have a violation of uh, yeah. work stuff. So, yeah. and that's why if you brought the same image to everyone and you want to explain the problems, so if, it's easier to explain a problem when everybody has exactly the same image and a visual one. Because okay. an image is a thousand words. So if you, that's it. So essentially we, our software bring the, I will say all the information that is very underground on the surface. That's something is really different between on, uh, underground mining and I will say surface mining. In surface mining, right. you, you look outside, you see, uh, you, you see the operation and people that is in management for underground mining, if you're not down the ground, you don't see what's happening on, on the ground. So that's Absolutely. why you're kind of tools. Absolutely bring a good combination backbone for every aspect and every, we'll say, uh, groups of personal in the same mind. It's, it's, I, it's become a, a backbone of communication for everyone. For sure. 
And I know that you guys at, Nem at Nemesis there, you, you're doing excellent work to bring that image, you know, to, to real life. That's your, that's your mission, essentially. Yes. This is uh, this is also important, you know, to consider all the technical technological factors that might come into place. You know, like like things change always. So, when doing a feasibility study, you know, like you need to be flexible with that too, because you never know what's going to happen. You you never you never know if there's a new technology that's going to come up, and you know. Uh, One of the thing is that that uh, that we help with is uh, when you 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 scan a place, and if you need to build a station, if you need to build something, then people can do a better planning because at the end of the day, you have the real shape. Instead of reworking everything on site, then they can, you know, because they will have the real shape of the rocks and everything. So they, they can rework the steel plate, something like that directly. So they, they will, will say minimize the rework down 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 the, the galleries and will help to uh, we'll say bring, f it will help to uh, construct faster. So if you mm. have a faster construction, then uh, you, you press, you, you, you're up, you say you minimize your construction time. It's it's money. Absolutely, absolutely. Those are very good points. Very in, very interesting. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to a little bit more towards the environment because we know that you know um, mining has a big reputation that it's against the environment. So, <laughs> Dr. Mitri, I'd like to ask you: How is the sustainable development included in a feasibility study? I think you're. Yeah, you're on mute, but hold on. Let me, I think it's, I have to control it from here. Okay. Can you do it now? I think you, uh, okay. There, there we go. Awesome. You, you <laughs> muted me. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm, I'm, I'm right. sure not to do that again. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in a feasibility study, um, all aspects of sustainability are accounted for. Um, right. So sustainability is, is classified into three categories. We have the economic sustainability, the social uh, sustainability, and environmental uh, sustainability. So uh, economic is probably the most traditional that goes yep. back to yep. uh, many years ago uh, with, with the net present value. But uh, nowadays, there is an expanded definition of, of economic sustainability so we want to make sure that the project has a, a continuous flow a cash flow uh, it has a reduced risk so we do all kinds of risk analyses and also it has to be uh, equi equitable to uh, the uh, the shareholders not only to um, the, the shareholders of the project but the shareholders and the community community are the stakeholders stakeholders is better than shareholders in this case uh, and employment employment is added now as as a category of economic sustainability mm -hmm. now when we move to um, environmental uh, sustainability i think uh, nick touched on this uh, touched on this uh, uh, earlier as being one of the important aspects of a a feasibility study, it is very important and it incorporates today uh, carbon footprint, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, right. protection of uh, the fresh water, um, solid waste management, and that includes tailings, uh, waste truck, overburden material, all that is, is part of the, um, of the um, environmental sustainability. Now, the social sustainability is probably the newest. It's, it's introduced maybe some 15 years ago uh, or even less. Uh, and that is all about the well-being of the, of the community, the education and training, right. uh, the, the yeah. company's commitment to uh, transparency, uh, accountability. If something happens, a disaster, the company has to declare itself accountable and share with the you community. See the news through transparency and they have to get uh, the local uh, community engaged so today's today's pre-feasibility study is is addressing all this okay. i see so it's, that's, today, that's even before yeah. the feasibility study pre-feasibility okay. study does all this today mm -hmm. and um, feasibility study will do this uh, in even greater detail okay i see so there's not just sustainability as as a package you need to first have it you need to have sort of like a prelim 
uh, sustainable development reports and then do, do that in more detail just to make sure that yeah. the environment is being taken care of and that yeah. the community yeah, is... Like this is today, in, in today's report, this is presented under sustainability. You say sustainability, number one, economic sustainability, and you address all these points. Of course, some of these points is the detailed usual economic analysis um, of, of net present value, sensitivity analysis, and so on. Then you do the Monte Carlo and so on. All of this is one category of the economic. Right. You need right. to talk about the potential employment and, and the other aspects. Cash flow, cash flow is, is, is very important. You okay, see. then we move on to environmental and presented in the same context under sustainability. I see, I see. And interesting. Uh, would you say that um, the same rules or the same, you know, all those sustainability um, developments that that are put into place would would that differ from one country to to another or how does it work it might it might but the, the rule is that if the owner is canadian and for example the mine is somewhere in, in africa uh where you don't have the same standards as canada because because the project owner is canadian they have to uh, respect the canadian the canadian uh, rule. i see yeah, I see. that's uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. Mr. Mr. Carl, I know that you've um, because of your work experience here, you're, you're probably very knowledgeable in that. Would you say that you know um, different places have the same rules, or how how is it different? Let's say from from Quebec, Canada here in, to uh, other places. It's totally different, and it's bring. Uh, I've just been in a project in. Uh, I don't want to say where, but in, in Africa, essentially. And uh, as right. uh, uh, Professor Amid uh, says, uh, I wear in the Canadian company with the Canadian standard with safety and regulation. Uh, we were doing a shaft, and uh, we have two other shafts that we're doing with local companies. It's a. Uh, uh, I will say that uh, my coworker says, you know, we have visited the chef. Don't go there. Uh, <laughs> and it's create uh, it's create a different dynamic also because the local population see it, all the safety, all the thing, all the good care that you you take about your workers, and they want the the. Every day you have people knocking on the door say, hey, we want to work for you. And that's create some tension between companies, something like that it's, 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 it's transferred to, a, I would say, a political game, I will say. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, in some country around the world, I will not step a foot on a mine. Uh, mm -hmm. I won't name it, right. but yeah, some country for sure. Uh, that's it. And um, But more and more, I will say the higher standards uh, will become uh, the way to do. Because at the end of the day, as uh, Mr. Amin says, uh, if you go back 40 years before, you know, the social acceptance of a project, uh, it was not part of, uh, of, of any mining project. But with all the environmental consensus, with all the population starting rising against projects, some projects has been killed by the non-social acceptance. Mm -hmm. And even if it was really economics, because before the only, the only thing was mining is just, can we make a buck about it? Yes, then we go. Uh, after that, says, hey, can we make a, a buck out with it, but still have like not too much impact on the environment? And then we go. And that's the third one. Uh, we need the social acceptance. And some country has the different, depending where if you are, will say Aboriginal lands or Indian mm -hmm. lands or whatever it is, uh, you need permission, it's long negotiation. Uh, and what you will bring, and the, the most of the question of the people is, uh, and uh, I return always to the, the South American project, see, because it was really beautiful. It was around the desert and the mine uh, will say restore more than 2,000 hectares of, of land that was totally desertic before they arriving. And they put parks, they put, uh, and they, they regrow, I will say the, so birds coming back, uh, you know, all, yes. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's the way they, and as I said, they bury the crusher, they re remove all the noise, the dust and everything. Like that. That's all I will say the impact on a daily life of some, someone surrounding the installation was removed. And you know, people were were good because we'll say they have good employments. They uh, construct school. They construct a uh, hospital. So everything mm -hmm. that the mind bring, uh, that's that's the key. At, for my for my opinion right now, for a new project, that is the key. You know, the social acceptance passed by how you will, how your project will be beneficial for the local populations. 
Absolutely. And like you said, like the, the mines are giving them resources too, right? They're giving them. Yeah, because they, they, they've been training. All this. Yeah. yeah, because at the end of the day, if you go in a remote location, you know, as I said, uh, I didn't see, I never see a mine, you know, downtown, uh, downtown, uh, yeah. <laughs> downtown, downtown Montreal, yeah. downtown LA, whatever it is. So it's yeah. always a remote location. So staff is number one. Uh, mm -hmm. term that will be able to say a threat or weakness on the project because you need to bring good staff. So the, the project has in Africa, so they, they bring some Canadian there. But right now, the problem with traveling, because those guys are maybe two months on, one month off, uh, it, it starts to be with all the traveling bands and everything that it start to be a threat because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, those guys cannot work uh, 12 hours a day for uh, 30 365 a day so they need time off so and they want to go back to their family something so you need to train local populations you need educations uh you need knowledge so and and it's 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 i will say it's a given it's a it's a will be a win-win situation because those those population you give them something and they give you back and that is the for way sure. to do a deal for, for now sure. absolutely those are very interesting points yeah it's uh that's that's very true as well yeah of uh, yeah uh, even in Quebec, uh, people may, may may not be aware, but uh, if my memory is correct, uh, at one point El Dorado uh, Gold in Valdor by uh, just bought, I will say, uh, medical equipment uh, to put in an hospital because they they find that that was totally crazy for their employees to drive eight hours from Valdor to Montreal to <laughs> go for a, to do for a health scan. It says it's it's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And because at the end of the day, if your employee uh, need to, I will say, have time off for health, uh, family issues, something like that. So even for uh, the, the mining industry, they, they need to work with the, their, their staff because at the end of the day, no staff, no, no extraction for now. Absolutely. Until we have robots that are doing all the human job down there, uh, we, need, we need humans. So you need mm -hmm. happy, a good, and you need to take care of them. For sure. Yes. Yep. Well, thank you for, for your comment, Mr. Carl. Um, those are definitely some of the new practices that we're seeing in mining today, how, you know, companies are taking more care of of their workers and also their environment so they can continue doing what they know to do best. Yes. <laughs> and jumping to our to our last question, um, Mr. Mitri, what do you what would you advise for those new hires in mines and consulting firms that are starting to work on visa feasibility studies based on on your knowledge on your experience uh well okay i got a couple of uh, advices yeah so first of all uh don't be don't be discouraged if you don't uh if you don't know everything because nobody knows everything Okay, so work in teams. Work in teams because you will always find uh, in a team the, the mining engineer who's uh, very familiar with geostat and likes to, to do the ore body modeling, another who likes uh, production and scheduling or has hands-on experience in production and scheduling. Uh, there is the, the mining engineer with uh, experience in mine safety practices and they can help with the with a, an inherently safe mind design. Uh, and there are those who are passionate about economic analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, th don't be shy to ask uh, people who uh, are specialists in in solid waste management, water waste yeah. management, the environment. You don't, you don't need to know everything, right? You yeah. don't have to. You have to know that, that this is due diligence. You have to have all these components in a team. Mm -hmm. Uh, look for the consultants who are experts in community relations to guide you. The, the community relations is not easy. It's uh, it's different from one region to another within the province of Quebec. So right. can you imagine worldwide? So look for uh, for people who are suitable uh, to to help you with the project. So bear in mind that um, it's okay not to know everything, and it's good to work in teams. Assemble a good team and work uh, in a team with diverse interests. That's my first advice uh, mm -hmm. to to people. Um, the second thing is that there are so many mines out there operating mm -hmm. in the world. Search. The key in a feasibility study is um, 
I mean, uh, Carl mentioned that the key is uh, one important item is a social license. Then, then that's when it comes to uh, permitting and implementation. If you didn't, if you didn't do your homework on social licenses, you're finished. There's no project. But to get up there, to have a good, solid technical project, um, it's a lot of work technically. Okay, and one way is to search. Uh, globally for mines that have similar mining conditions, similar mining environments. Okay. And, and try to learn from those experiences and apply a good filter. Be very, very strict with yourself and reject uh, items that will show dissimilarity with your mining project and continue to do that. Because there is a lot of mines out there operating and running and there's a lot of things to, uh, to learn from that. So that's uh, mm -hmm. that's my second advice. Go search, investigate, and filter. Right. My my last advice to the uh, the young people is think outside the box. Don't take it for granted that the minds out there are perfect. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Think outside the box. Come up with new idea and ask your teammates to challenge you to play the devil's advocate. Say. Okay, criticize my ideas. I want to know. I want to do this new system. What's wrong with it? Okay, right. and this is how we improve. Now remember, mining is is a private business. Okay, so not all the bad news are out there. Mines have their own issues and they have their own challenges. Okay, so what what we hear and see about the mines, is the success stories, and so on. But like Carl was mentioning a problem uh, with safety and the vent pipes, you're not gonna see this in an article. The, the vent pipes are probably inst installed in a mine or, or, or the mine is, uh, traffic is going crazy because production and development are happening at the same time by mistake on the same level. So don't, don't take everything for granted. Take it with a grain of salt, come up with, with new ideas and ask people to challenge you on it because this is how you can make better mining systems. Great. Sounds good. And maybe you can elaborate on this by answering one of the questions that uh, the audience, uh, one of the audience uh, is asking, what level of detail engineering would be the minimum threshold for a new mining project? I'm not sure what to answer, but you're probably not. <laughs> no, then, uh, I will talk about feasibility study. Okay. Feasibility study has a very high content of mining detailed engineering. Right. Okay, 75%, 80% mining engineering details. But in terms of engineering details that you need for, uh, for EPCM, uh, uh, engineering procurement, uh, that comes later. The, the, the purpose of feasibility study, sometimes it's called bankable study. So you're asking for uh, funding or uh, finance of 500 million. You don't need the engineering detailed study to ask mm -hmm. for $500 million. What you need is sufficient detailed information that the investor will hire a mining consultant to review your feasibility study and, and examine it closely with a microscope to see if there's any pitfalls. So at that level, feasibility study is more like 10 to 40% engineering, not more than that, okay? The later that comes with contracting construction company, EPCM. I see, I see. And also the thing is, uh, people need to understand when you start a project, it's like you have to eat a big elephant, you know? You need to go one spoon at the time, mm -hmm. so you will pass through it. And, and the thing is, at one point, sometime you don't know the answers. And if you just overanalyze it, you will just get paralyzed. It pass through it. Just put an assumption. Put a note says, you know, I, I did in this assumption, and I, I, I guess that numbers or something like that. So at the point you're still progressing. And the other thing that uh, Dr. Ari, Annie said is really important. Is communication is the key because at, at the point, if you communicate to your team and you are really good team players, you don't possess all the knowledge. It's just impossible. But if you can go see, uh, seek the answer locally because, uh, and you need to verify also because I've been on a project where the guy said, oh, the ground is good, the ground is good. And, you know, we had to move 100 feet away and the ground was 
I don't want to say the word, but was mm -hmm. as hell. And we had a lot of problem, but people assume that because it's just like 100 foot away, it has yeah. the same properties. That's a big, that's, you know, yeah. that's a beginner mistake. And it, it, that's shit happened, you know, in project at yeah. the end of the day, shit happened. And the other thing that people need to understand is sometime when you want to resolve a problem is not who's wrong, who's right. It's what need to be fixed and you need to move forwards. And uh, that is really, really important. Right, right. I see. Dr. Hani Mitri, Mr. Carl Fecto, I would like to thank you both for uh, being guests on this first ep episode. Uh, we unfortunately lost Mr. Nick. He's not here, but I would like to thank you very much, Mr. Nick, as well, for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you all very much for all your input, uh, sharing your work experiences and your knowledge with us. We are very grateful to have you. And uh, thank you uh, to the audience as well who watched uh, through. And um, I'd like to also mention uh, for the people who are watching right now, let me just uh, share my screen right here. Just give me one second. Make sure to follow us on uh, Instagram at Promine Software and at Progeox Software. So next episode, we'll be having a special giveaway. Uh, so make sure to follow us on Instagram. Um, again, at Promine Software and at Progeox Software as written like this. And um, thanks again, everyone. I wish you all a great day. And thanks again for coming. Thank you for having us. Thank you very yes. much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Mitri. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Thank Thanks. you.